Hi everyone, I'm Ming Zi, and today I'll be taking you through the basics of net zero and what a net zero target actually is. Although the term is bandied about a lot, net zero is not a monolithic concept. It is important to understand the complexities behind it in order to be as transparent and clear with our legal drafting as possible. Net zero is the point where there is no net impact on the climate from GHG emissions. There are two main ways of reaching net zero, reducing emissions and removing emissions. Activities that reduce emissions include switching to low emissions technologies like solar power and improving the energy efficiency of buildings. Negative emissions are things like carbon sinks, both natural ones such as forests and man-made ones such as carbon capture and storage technology. The term net zero can be applied to multiple entities at multiple levels. This can get confusing at times. Investors and shareholders like the Climate Action 100 Plus group speak about net zero financial portfolios. So they are assessing the degree to which companies within their portfolios in aggregate have plans to reach the state of net zero impact on the climate. Governments take a whole of economy view of the transition to net zero such as the UK's sixth carbon budget recommendations. Corporates and indeed individuals have net zero plans for their business operations and lifestyle choices. So net zero is the vocabulary that the international community has rallied behind. It's what the UNFCCC, the COP conferences, corporates and financial institutions are using. But what does it really mean to have a net zero target? If you follow the media's coverage of climate finance, it might seem as though everybody under the sun is setting a net zero target. But here's the rub. One person's vision of net zero may vastly differ, differ from another's. The key then is to look behind the label of net zero to what the target actually is, how it is calibrated, and what accountability measures are in place. There are shades of green for net zero targets, and as lawyers, we need to be live to these nuances when we draft. There are seven key elements of a net zero target, and I'll be taking you through these in turn. Within each element is a spectrum of ambition. Now, different organizations and countries are on different stages of their net zero journey, and at TCLP, regardless of where you start, the expectation is that you climb up the ladder of ambition. The first element is scope. Carbon emissions are bounded following the greenhouse gas protocols scoped approach. Scope 1 emissions are direct emissions from sources owned or controlled by the company. If you are a logistics company, this might be the emissions from your heavy vehicles. For a refining company, this might be the fuel combusted at the refinery. Scope 2 are emissions coming from the energy consumed by the company. So this includes the energy consumption of a business office blocks, um, and whatever is needed to run um, your machinery and your plants. Scope three are indirect emissions from the company's entire value chain, even though those sources may not be owned nor controlled by the company. So these include all the emissions of your suppliers upstream, as well as your downstream transportation, distribution and use of products. It's important to note that the vast majority of most companies' emissions will occur, occur at the scope three level. For the oil and gas sector, for example, easily 90% or more of emissions will be in scope three. The international consensus is that any credible net zero target must include all three scopes of emission. Because, logically speaking, how do we ensure a whole of economy transition to net zero if we miss out any one scope? Now, there are several difficulties with including scope three emissions. For example, there is a lack of high quality scope 3 data and the companies do not control um, these emissions and these sources um, and there are issues of double counting. A couple of solutions include setting materiality thresholds um, for example, having to include all of your significant emission categories so that a maximum of 5% of your overall emissions are omitted. Um, or perhaps you could stipulate that only particular sectors with very high scope 3 exposure have to disclose them. Um, for example, oil and gas, mining and metals, and automobiles. Second element is warming. I like to think of this as the area under the graph 
or in terms of cumulative emissions. Recall that net zero is where there is no net impact on the climate from greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is a state of the world and it is a point in time. It says nothing about how much emissions went on before we got to net zero. In other words, net zero can be reached at many temperatures. We could reach net zero here, here, and also here. The more we delay, the more emissions will generate in the meantime. But we can also reach net zero in 2050 and go far hotter than a warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. How? By continuing to emit as business as usual, having a huge realization in 2040, and then pushing the throttle on decarbonization. So we'll have emitted this much more than the alternative scenario if we'd had a steady stage decarbonization. And all of these extra emissions would overshoot our carbon budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. This brings us to timing and targets. It's international consensus that 2050 is the year to shoot for, but some easy to decarbonize sectors should aim for before this. The basic practice is to build an interim target as a measure of accountability. The Supreme Court of Ireland, for instance, has ruled that the Irish government was in breach of its climate change obligations because its net zero plan did not set any targets in the lead up to 2050. The pace of decarbonisation is a tricky one. The European Commission states that any credible net zero plan needs to cut its carbon footprint by at least 7% year on year. But this 7% is a sector agnostic figure and many people and institutions have argued for more industry and region specific approaches. A lot more work needs to be done to develop these granular pathways, as well as coordinate across them to achieve Paris alignment across the board. And don't forget to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. We're going to have to be net negative, not just net zero, for a long time after 2050 and most net zero plans don't even look beyond this horizon. Offsets are essentially paying somebody else to do your emissions reductions or removals for you. We might question whether this is a valid strategy at all. And then there is a secondary question of, if we do use offsets, how do we use them responsibly? The basic practice is to adhere to a mitigation hierarchy meaning that you should reduce your own emissions first before attempting to compensate your unavoidable or residual emissions. We also want to think about the quality and type of offsets. Are they offsets that reduce emissions? For example, funding a wind farm. Or are they offsets that remove emissions, such as planting trees, carbon sinks? Do these offsets have additionality? So, but for you paying for this tree, would it have been planted anyway? Are they permanent? So in 10 years, will a wildfire burn down the tree that you bought via your offset, thereby releasing the, car the carbon sequestered back into the atmosphere? And above all, how do you verify these things? A net zero transition must be just, both as a matter of principle and in order to get the buy-in of our population. Considerations of equity feature in all of the elements that I've just discussed. When looking at decarbonisation pathways, might they be slower for regions that are underdeveloped and require more investments in infrastructure? Or perhaps uh, slow for industries where emissions are hard to reduce? When implementing these plans, are the communities and workers impacted brought along with the change? Offsetting is also an international business. Where are your offsets being anchored and how do they impact the communities around them? We want to think about high level engagement for these targets. Are decisions around climate risks taken at the board level? And how is accountability ensured? Interim targets will contribute to this, as will reporting and disclosure frameworks like the TCFD and SASB. Lastly, we want to query whether the corporate's lobbying activities trade association memberships and public policy positions are Paris aligned. I've just given you the big picture of net zero target setting, but your legal drafting will only be the building blocks, so one piece of the jigsaw puzzle 
that a client uses to build their net zero strategy. Not all of the elements that I've just outlined may be relevant for your clause, and some may be more important than others. For example, if your clause relates to supply chain emission reductions obligations, the most relevant element will be scope and how it addresses a client's scope 3 emissions. Nevertheless, we're doing this presentation now so that from the very outset, you are conscious of the net zero outcome that you are drafting towards. After you finish drafting, you'll be doing a self-assessment of where your clause fits on the net zero spectrum. You'll be inputting it into this board. I'd like to make the caveat that more ambitious doesn't necessarily mean better. Sometimes we want to draft in a consciously low barrier to entry to encourage people to start their net zero journeys. Other times we might want to pitch the standard high to push the boundaries of what your industry thinks is possible. The key thing is to be transparent with where you are pegging the ambition of your clause and why you are doing it. One last point. A minority of clauses won't relate to net zero at all, and instead they may speak to other elements like biodiversity, environmental protection, or climate change resilience. For example, a clause around food supply chains and risks from climate change induced weather events would speak to resilience. Thank you so much for listening.